consequences of my own actions. What's up? What's up? Trino. Oh, sorry. Didn't see you there. Hi everyone, it's Grayson and this is Grayson Talks Everything. If you're new to the channel, welcome. And if you're not new and are returning, welcome back. Do be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel if you have not already. And also follow my Instagram so you never miss the latest updates when videos of mine are coming out. And to just never miss and like and admire some fan art of mine that I regularly post on there. Some of that should be showing up on the screen right now. All right, so yeah, and then the link to my Instagram, speaking of, is always in my description, but if you want to know my Instagram tag right now so you can follow me immediately, that should be showing up somewhere on the screen as well. All right, let's get into it. Today, we are going to be talking about um, What If, episodes one through four, and this is going to be my spoiler review and breakdown, so yeah, I've been warned, there are definitely, there are definitely going to be spoilers in this episode, or not this episode, this this video you know what I mean but yeah um yeah and just because I'm pretty sure some of you guys will ask the reason that I haven't been catching up on the show as much as I wanted to is because I've been in school for a couple of weeks now school like just started for me um so I've been in a real bind when it comes to my schedule um hopefully my Shang-Chi video will come out tomorrow evening as well um, it probably will. Hopefully it will. Let's hope it does. But um, actually, as well, um, I have been keeping up with What If through my artwork, which again is on my Instagram, link in my bio. Not my bio, but my, my description. I'm so sorry. L let's, let's get into it. So overall, I really love Marvel's What If, and there has been a lot of great superhero animation over the past few years, specifically coming from DC, and now Marvel Studios has finally come into the animation arena and immediately jumped to the front of the pack. I think this show borrows heavily from Disney's classic animation style with an incredible amount of depth, unlike other animated shows, and a tremendous amount and use of light that gave it a magical sort of feeling, almost like Steven Spielberg's earlier film. And speaking of episodes, the first episode also borrows heavily from Raiders of the Lost Ark and the Iron Giant, which combined with the Disney-esque art style makes it feel more like an animated movie more than an episode. And wow, Captain Carter was spectacular to see on screen. From her action scenes and movements to how she handled the sword and shield, she somehow manages to have an edge up on Steve Rogers and to truly be Marvel's answer to Wonder Woman. Speaking of action, the directing of the action scenes and the animation and the voice acting, especially from Haley Atwell and Josh Keaton, who does a surprisingly phenomenal like impression of Chris Evans, along with the writing, were all just very, very well done in this episode. Um, I love episode one. And when it comes to episode two, it was another amazing episode with another great, but sadly the last performance by Chadwick Boseman as T'Challa due to his tragic death last year, exactly last year, To now that I'm thinking about it, uh, uh, it's a mess. And like the last episode, the episode had a very strong and powerful use of light and had the Disney animation style. It felt almost exactly like watching a full length movie but this episode felt very different due to the fact that it's truly capturing the feeling of Wakanda and Guardians of the Galaxy at the same time. The voice cast of this episode is also phenomenal, including Karen Gillan, Benicio Del Toro, and even the guy who voices um, Drax in this episode very quickly, literally sounds exactly like Dave Bautista. It was kind of insane. I also love how, along with Chadwick's phenomenal voice acting, the script perfectly drives home the fact that Chitala does just radiate pure goodness and that was truly wonderful to see, especially how he had that effect on Thanos in the episode. It was, wow, like his goodness literally like saved the universe a couple of times from how it implied in the episode. That was insane. I loved that. And when it comes to episode 3 that recently released, like, last Wednesday, I've heard some people really hate on this episode and call it boring, but I actually really like this episode a lot more than I thought I would due to the fact that I can't pass up a good murder mystery. I love those. And I also love the idea and the logistics of the Fury's Big Reek MCU storyline, so I really like seeing it fully adapted with a dark, sinister twist. 
I'm also a huge Samuel Jackson fan in general, so anything he's a part of is immediately a classic, <laughs> excluding Pulp Fiction. I really don't like that movie. And as for episode four of Marvel's What If, it was dark, emotional, it had a unique story with incredible action and stunning visuals all coming together beautifully to make this episode the best episode of the series so far. This episode again gets so dark and, and the ending is so good, easily taking down episode three as the darkest timeline. And I mean, wow, if these episodes are a sign of things to come in phase four and five, I am now in more invested than ever. Marvel's willingness to explore extreme consequences for its principal characters is amazing and this episode went about as dark as possible with that concept. I'll just say this, if Doctor Strange 2, and I suspect No Way Home, we'll get to that later, follows up on this episode, it will be the most emotionally gripping comic book movie ever. So excited for these new episodes to come. Overall, I'm loving Marvel's What If so far and I love how consistent MCU Phase 4 has been in my opinion. Now, back to the breakdown part of this video, and spoilers ahead, like truly big spoilers. So, Marvel's What If is setting up something big, and episode 3 of the Marvel Anthology makes it clear these animated episodes aren't as disconnected as we thought they were, but that's a discussion for a later time. Right now, we need to talk about one specific scene from Marvel's What If episode 3, and how it fixes Marvel's original continuity sin. The Hulk has always been the ugly stepchild of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and not just because he's big, green, and his pants are ripped, it's due to the complex legal reasons. Marvel can't legally make any new Hulk-centric movies, which means all we have is 2008's The Incredible Hulk, a movie that never really fit with the rest of the MCU tonally or stylistically. Love it or hate it, the 2008 Edward Warren superhero movie is MCU canon. Even if Marvel recast the big green guy with Mark Ruffalo a few years later for the Avengers. Now, thanks to What If, the Incredible Hulk's place in this interconnected multiverse feels stronger than ever. That's because in Episode 3, Black Widow, who is voiced here by Lake Bell, not Scarlett Johansson, which kind of made the episode feel off to me, or not the episode, but Black Widow, um, drops into the middle of the Incredible Hulk on a mission to find out why someone is killing all of Nick Fury's would-be Avengers. In just a few minutes, this scene accomplishes a lot. For one thing, it puts Mark Ruffalo into the role once occupied by Edward Norton, creating a much cleaner continuity between this movie and the rest of the Hulk's MCU story. It also clearly places the events of The Incredible Hulk within the time frame of other Marvel movies like Thor and Iron Man 2, while mega fans likely already know that these three stories all take place within the same span of a few days, that's likely new information for most people watching What If Episode 3. Beyond simply retconning the MC's past to make a bit more sense, what if could be setting up important connections for the future? We already know that Abomination, aka Emil Blonsky, played by Tim Roth, will return in Shang-Chi after making his one and only appearance in The Incredible Hulk. Meanwhile, Tim Blake Nelson's Samuel Stearns was clearly set up in that movie to become the big brain supervillain leader. That's a plot thread that's never been pulled, but perhaps now it will be, either in a future What If episode or in live action, particularly the live action Disney Plus show that is coming up, She-Hulk, which stars um, Tatiana Maslany as Jennifer Walters, the Hulk's cousin. Sort of a loophole through the you can't make a live action Hulk movie situation. And who knows, maybe Betty Ross, played by Liv Tyler, will even show up in live action at some point again. Thanks to What If, literally anything seems possible. Marvel's What If takes us to its darkest alternate timeline yet in Episode 3. Unlike the show's first two installments, which presented timelines fairly similar to the ones in the Marvel Cinematic Universe's prime reality, What If Episode 3 spends a week in a far more unlucky timeline than we've ever seen previously before. It's titled, What If the World Lost Its Mightiest Heroes, the episode sees Iron Man, Thor, Hawkeye the Hulk, and Black Widow all murdered in cold blood before they're even given a chance to become team members. It's a surprisingly dark episode, especially coming off of What If's relatively lighthearted first two chapters, and one that imagines a universe in which the Avengers weren't around to stop the kind of invasion they were brought together to fight in the first place. But it also opens the door for an epic season 2 storyline. 
In the final act of What If Episode 3, the Avengers mysterious murderer is finally revealed to be a crazed Hank Pym, and he's quickly apprehended by Nick Fury, voiced by Samuel Jackson, and Loki, voiced by Tom Hiddleston. However, Hank's capture doesn't lead the episode towards a last-minute happy ending. Instead, as the episode's closing moments reveal, the deaths of so many original Avengers leave Earth open for Loki, the acting king of Asgard, to take it over with full might of the uh, Asgardian army behind him. It's essentially a version of what might have happened if the Avengers weren't around to stop the God of Mischief when he invaded New York in 2012. Loki's invasion doesn't stop Fury from continuing his efforts towards putting together a superhero team though. In fact, the episode ends with Fury finding Steve Rogers frozen in ice while Carol Danvers aka Captain Marvel shows up back on Earth and asks where is the fight before what if episode 3 comes to an end. It's an unexpected conclusion to a legitimately surprising episode of television and one that sets up an arc we may very well get to see continued in the future. Based on how the first three episodes have ended, it's looking increasingly like that What If second season will pick up with many of the characters and cliffhangers introduced in the first season. That seemed to be the case last week with its second episode's twist ending, and we wouldn't be surprised if the alternate timeline that's imagined in What If episode 3 comes back into play at some point as well. To be totally clear, it's not hard to see why Marvel might want to explore this particular storyline further either. Not only does it allow them to assemble an entirely new team of Avengers, with only one of its original members present in the lineup, it also gives them the chance to depict a conflict that Marvel fans have already spent years theorizing about as it is. In this case, said conflict would see an alternate team of Avengers rising in rebellion against both Loki and the Asgardians. That's an undeniably exciting possibility, especially considering how much more powerful Loki would likely be with the Asgardians behind him instead of the Chitauri. Plus, with Thor out of the picture, what if episode 3 also opens the door for Captain America to start wielding Mjolnir far sooner than he did in the MCU's prime timeline? There's no telling which what if stories and characters may or may not be brought back into the show's second season. The Disney Plus series anthology format makes predicting its future stories an inherently difficult task. But assuming that the creatives behind the show do plan on revisiting some of its season 1 realities later, and we have reason to believe that's actually the case, there's no denying that the ending of What If Episode 3's cliffhanger that practically is begging to be picked back up next year, or whenever season 2 premieres. Now let's do a deep dive into Episode 4. And man oh man, Doctor Strange has gone through a lot. And in the alternate universe of the Disney Plus series What If, this loss is only compounded. In episode 4, which debuted on Wednesday, September 1st, we find Strange in a terrible situation. Instead of losing his skills as a surgeon, he loses something far more valuable. And there's nothing that will stop him from getting that back. Not the rules of time travel, not the universe, not even the Watcher. Here's everything you need to know about the new episode and the comics that inspired it. And warning, there are major spoilers for this episode, so you've been warned once again. The change in the sacred timeline in episode 4 of What If is simple. What if instead of losing his hands in a car crash, Stephen Strange loses his heart, Dr. Christine Palmer. She stood by Stephen Strange after his accident, so it makes sense losing her would plunge him into a dark place. While he still trains and gains the powers of time and the dimension manipulation like Doctor Strange in the main t timeline, the Sacred Timeline, he doesn't use them to save the world. Instead, he focuses on Groundhog Daying himself in the day he lost Christine, trying over and over to save her life, but failing every single time. And if you've seen this latest What If episode and the trailer for Spider-Man No Way Home, which opens on December 17th, 2021, Strange's attitude will seem quite similar. The upcoming sequel, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, is set to explore the many timelines unleashed in Loki and documented in What If. In fact, we may have already seen this character's live-action debut in the trailer for No Way Home. Unfortunately, there is no way of knowing until the film opens in December. It's after Strange's tragic loss of Christine that he is told by the Ancient One visiting from beyond the grave that her death is a fixed point in time, happening no matter what he tries. But that's not enough of a reason to stop trying to save her. He begins summoning creatures to defeat them and absorb their power, including the tentacle monster we saw in What If Episode 1. 
This leads to a fight that's a lot more Avengers Endgame than What If. Strange in the Altered Universe, aka Dark Strange, faces off against the Doctor Strange we recognize. They fight epically and at one point Strange even reaches out to the Watcher for help. Unlike his comic persona, the Watcher seems to be sticking to his don't interfere rule for now. Unfortunately, Dark Strange's plans backfires. He is able to save Christine, but in the process he morphs into a hideous creature. He saved his love but lost himself along the way. If this What If episode is anything to go by, Dark Strange is a force to be reckoned with, and it feels like we'll see a lot more of him. And that might be the Doctor Strange we somehow see in Spider-Man No Way Home, because we did see him like in a tough soul with Spider-Man in a train sequence in the trailer. So we'll just have to wait till December to really find out. Who will replace Thanos as the Marvel Cinematic Universe's next big bad? There are plenty of options, from obvious villains like King the Conqueror to celestial beings like Galactus to fan favorites like Doctor Doom. But there's one Marvel supervillain that could top them all, both in terms of threat level and general weirdness. And the latest episode of What If on Disney Plus seems to confirm that's where the MCU is headed, for now at least. And we're talking, of course, about Shuma Gorath. So grab a tentacle and let's dive in. In What If Episode 4, we see an alternate version of Doctor Strange who seeks out magic not because his hands are destroyed in a car crash, but because that very same accident kills the love of his life. This is a darker, more disturbed version of Strange who ultimately obtains unholy powers when he learns the Time Stone isn't enough to bring Christine Palmer back to life. In the process, Strange encounters an interdimensional being portrayed simply as a mass of giant tentacles. The first time he meets it, the tentacles win. The second time, Strange wins, absorbing their powers into his own body. But in the process, Marvel could be introducing fans to a classic comic book villain, the ancient demon known as Shuma Gorath. This also isn't the first time we've seen a similar beast. In What If Episode 1, an alternate version of Red Skull uses the Tesseract to unleash an identical being he calls the Champion of Hydra, a name with no meaning in the comics. Is it possible that they are both the same creature? And if so, could Marvel be hinting at its next big bad through What If, just like it did with Thanos in 2012's The Avengers? Let's take a closer look at the beast itself. First mentioned in 1972's Journey into Mystery Volume 2 Issue 1, only to appear a year later in Marvel Premiere Issue 10, Shuma Gorath is, among other things, a giant eye with tentacles. It's also one of the other great old ones predating most things in the Marvel Universe. Shuma has ruled over hundreds of dimensions, including ours. It controlled ancient Earth for many years before being banished by a time-traveling sorcerer. Shuma Gorath is sometimes but not always described as omnipotent. Its powers include the ability to communicate across dimensions and even control others throughout the multiverse. It can also shoot powerful energy blasts from either its eye or its tentacles, which are capable of destroying entire realities. Shuma can even destroy galaxies using nothing but the power of its own aura. On the defensive side, its skin is resistant to most magic, making it extremely difficult to defeat. In other words, Thanos without the Infinity Gauntlet is no match for this giant tentacle monster. But can even the Avengers defeat it? Shuma Gorath has fought many of Marvel's heroes, and in the comics, the Avengers have defeated the monster multiple times. However, its first and often primary enemy was Doctor Strange, who once traveled back in time to witness Shuma's original banishment from Earth in 1 million BC. With all this in mind, it makes sense that Shuma Gorath would show up in the Strange-centric What If Episode 4, but it may also confirm a popular rumor about a major upcoming Marvel movie. According to recent reports, Shuma will be the main villain of Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, the report from a fan site The Illuminati, which should be taken with a grain of salt, claims Shuma Gorath will appear in an unspecified MCU title. But Doctor Strange 2 feels like the obvious answer, mostly due to their shared comic book history. Is it possible that, after getting a taste of Strange in the Multiverse via What If, Shuma Gorath will go looking for the real thing? If that's what happens, the Sorcerer Supreme is about to face a threat unlike anything the MCU has seen before. We'll just have to find out when Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness premieres and to just see how What If the Season 1 just pans out. 
So that is my spoiler review and breakdown of What If Episodes 1 through 4. What did you think of this video? What did you think of the episodes? I'd really like to hear your opinions on this. Share all your thoughts down below. And again, don't forget to like and subscribe and share this video and all that other fun stuff. And again, follow my Instagram as well so you never miss updates on when videos of mine are coming out. And to just like and admire some fan art of mine that I regularly post on there. Alright, bye everyone.